Welcome everyone to Zillow's fifth housing forum. I'm Zillow CEO Spencer Raskoff. I'm very, very pleased to be your host today. We're thrilled that all of you in the audience and those watching via the live stream online can join us today to discuss the future of housing. It's hard to characterize the U.S. housing market over the past decade as anything other than a roller coaster, with home values dropping so far and so fast, and then, almost without warning, rising nearly as far and fast. But now, finally, the ride appears to be slowing down as the market moves towards normal. And I think we can all agree that housing is better when it's boring. Now that we're able to catch our breath, we realize that we've ended up in a new place, that new dynamics and trends have emerged, ones that will shape and define housing in the coming decades. Today, we'll talk about how rising mortgage rates will affect the move-up segment of the housing market, and how the largest and most diverse generation in U.S. history, the millennials, will influence the housing market and our cities with their preferences on where and how they want to live. We've gathered an esteemed group of policymakers and experts to lead our discussion, but we want to hear from everyone in this room as well. Throughout the program, we'll ask for your help answering a series of questions about a few of the topics that our panelists will be discussing. And the first question for the day is here on the screen. And it's also on your chair. So please take a moment to text your answers to these questions using the phone number 22333. You can see we provided a code next to each answer. So for example, send a text to 22333, answering in five years the most important housing issue will be access to financing, affordability, changing housing preferences, or home price value volatility. And text the number on the right that begins with a six uh, to 22333 to place your vote. We'll be releasing the results of these polls on Twitter and on the screens around the stage. You can also join the conversation on Twitter today using the hashtag HousingFuture. And we'll be using Twitter during the Q&A portions of the program, a great opportunity for both those here in the room and those watching at home or at work to ask questions. So on behalf of myself and Zillow Chief Economist Dr. Stan Humphreys and the team here at Zillow, thank you very much for coming. I'm now very pleased to introduce Jason Furman. Jason was appointed Chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors by President Obama in 2013. Previously, he served as Assistant to the President for Economic Policy and the Principal Deputy Director of the Economic Council. From 2007 to 2008, he was a Senior Fellow in Economic Studies and Director of the Hamilton Project at the Brookings Institution. He also served as Staff Economist at the Council of Economic Advisors under President Clinton and Senior Advisor to the Chief Economist and Senior Vice President of the World Bank. Jason is also the editor of several books on economic policy, including Path to Prosperity and Who Has the Cure. Please join me in welcoming Jason Furman. Uh, thank you for, for the introduction. Thank you for organizing this conference and this important conversation. In the past, um, few months, there's been no shortage of public concern over the opportunities for America's millennial generation of young adults, be it their prospects for school, job, house, or life partner in the aftermath of the Great Recession. Such attention is certainly well merited. The Great Recession was felt acutely across the American population, but perhaps more so for our youths. While the unemployment rate for those over 34 peaked at 8%, the unemployment rate among those ages 18 to 34 peaked at 14% in 2010 and remains elevated despite substantial improvement. Delinquency rates on student loans have risen several percentage points since the Great Recession and have continued to rise into the recovery. And the home ownership rate among young adults has dropped from a peak of 43% in 2005 to 37% in 2013, concurrent with a large increase in the share living with their parents. As often occurs when precipitous changes appear to mark a generation, there has been much speculation regarding the economic forces driving the difference between millennials and those in my generation or my parents' generation. Are good jobs harder to find for today's young adults? Will growing student debt hold back millennials' home ownership opportunities? 
Will they even purchase homes? Or do we have on our hands a lost generation consigned to a lifetime of renting, living in small condos, or even worse for all concerned, spending the coming decades in their parents' basements? To be sure, these questions do not admit any straightforward answers, and it may take years before we're able to fully disentangle the interplay between the housing and labor markets in a satisfying way. But today I would like to look at millennials more closely and bring to bear some of the existing economic data and research on the issue in an attempt to better understand the trends in millennials' behavior with particular attention to its implications for the housing sector. These data imply that it is premature to suggest that trends among today's young youth are a reflection of a profound change in their preferences or attitudes in the aftermath of the Great Recession, when many of these trends were already on the horizon and happening gradually before that recession, and as is typical, a large downturn in economic activity will lead to a bunch of temporary changes um, as well. However, regardless of the causes of the recent developments, the ultimate outcomes for this generation, and more broadly, I rent will depend on our policy choices, and I will be um, talking about that at the conclusion of my remarks. I want to start out more broadly, though, and talk about millennials in the economic recovery. There's no doubt that millennials have been very unlucky, given that many of them had to seek out a first job in what was an extraordinarily distressed labor market in 2008. As Peter Orzag recently noted, born in 1988, sorry, the Great Recession was the most severe since the Great Depression, putting 8.6 million people out of work, of whom 47% were between the ages of 18 and 34, which is generally the definition I'm going to be using for millennials in my remarks today. If you look at the overall unemployment rate for workers between 18 and 34, it peaked at 14% and has since come down to 9%, which is about 72% of the way back to its pre-recession average, but still unacceptably high. That is, as you can see in the table on the screen, slightly less than the recovery for the overall unemployment rate, which is 83% of the way back to the average of the last expansion. A range of other labor market indicators tell a similar story. A substantial recovery, but one that is not complete and is lagging somewhat behind the recovery for other age groups. Long-term unemployment for millennials, like for the broader workforce, is double its previous average. The unemployment rate of young college graduates remains much lower than that of all other groups, although it declined somewhat slower than those with less education, and as a result is only two-thirds of the way to recovered. Finally, the overall unemployment rate um, is, the overall unemployment recovery is not just in the official unemployment rate. If you look at broader measures of people without jobs that include discouraged workers or so-called marginally attached workers, those who would like a job but have given up looking, have gone down almost as much as well. All of them have further to go. The Great Recession comes on top of a longer term trend of reduced labor force participation and increased schooling by young people. Labor force participation among the youngest workers has fallen steadily since its peak in the late 1980s and is now five percentage points lower than it was 30 years ago. However, at the same time, the share of people in this age group in school has risen, so that the fraction either working or in school has been roughly constant. School enrollment has a cyclical component, as young people enroll in school in greater numbers and stay longer in recessions, and the recovery from them, both because unemployment is high and in order to enhance their skills to compete in a tougher job market. Encouragingly, most of this rise in college enrollment among millennials comes from students uh, who appear to be on track to complete their degrees on time, not from students who are avoiding the job market 
by taking five or six years to complete a four-year degree. However, accompanying this increase in schooling has been an increase in the amount of student debt and an alarming um, increase in student debt delinquency rates. The Federal Reserve Bank of New York estimates that in the first quarter, the total student loan debt is nearly $1.1 trillion, the second largest category of consumer debt after mortgages. Of total student debt today, roughly 11% has been characterized as seriously delinquent, up 4.4 percentage points since the end of 2005. Numerous factors can account for the increase in borrowing, including not just the rise in cost of college, but also factors like the growth in enrollment of the lower income student population. Related to these trends, millennials are also getting married later than previous cohorts. But as with educational attainment, the declines in marriage propensities for millennials are largely in line with a strong pre-existing trend that goes back for decades and no sign of major change in the wake of the Great Recession. Finally, to link this broader economic overview to the housing issues that you're all focused on today is the fact that record numbers of 18 to 34 year olds are currently living at home with their parents, as you see in this figure. This means they not only do not own their own homes, but they're not a source of demand for rentals either. This elevated share of young adults living at home is especially notable among millennials without jobs, which, when combined with the observations about millennial student debt burdens and marriage rates, has raised numerous questions about how prolonged their delay into these conventional indicators of adulthood might be, including whether and when they will become homeowners. For example, it's easy to speculate how falling homeownership rates and the recovery of multifamily construction signal a major shift in preferences towards renting among millennials, or at least those that have moved out of their parents' homes. In what follows, I will discuss whether this particular interpretation of the data is justified, or whether a more nuanced view is useful in understanding the implications of millennials' behavior for the housing market. So let me now take a deeper dive into home and housing activity. From 2012, 2010 to 2013, um, residential investment grew at double-digit rates, making a major and timely contribution to the overall economic recovery at a time when fiscal support was waning. At the same time, we've seen stronger house prices, fewer underwater borrowers, and falling distressed sales. But even with this recovery, residential construction is still well below its pre-recession, pre-bubble, steady state levels. And in the last two quarters, the residential component of GDP has been negative, although this largely reflects declining commissions associated with existing home sales rather than declining construction activity. This restrained activity is likely a function of several factors tight lending standards and supply material constraints, to name a few. But particularly over the long run, construction is largely demand-driven, for which a key demographic is millennials, who now comprise the largest generation in US history. As seen in um, this table, to the degree, well, you probably can see this table, um, the single largest driver of the overall demand for residential construction is the number of new households formed, or household formation. In recent years, getting an accurate picture of new household formation has been difficult due to an unprecedented divergence in readings from the two different surveys that are the standard source of these data. These estimates suggest a wide range of 600,000 to 1.3 million households per year. If the reality is somewhere in between, then as you can see, household formation in recent years has been weak and below average household formation in recent decades. Household formation is the product of two factors, the overall growth in population and the headship rate. 
the share of the population that either rents or owns, in effect, the share of the population not living at home. The weak recent household formation readings mostly reflect a decline in headship, including for young adults, as you can see in this next figure. In fact, the decline in headship among young adults alone over the last decade likely resulted in a loss of over one million households cumulatively. So what caused this drop in the headship rate in millennials, which has stabilized and led to a slight increase recently, but not enough to make up um, for the drop and not close to as much of a recovery as we've seen in other economic indicators like the unemployment rate. Um, some have speculated that this increase in living is just an artifact of measurement error associated with college. Um, we don't see evidence for that. One factor that's certainly at play is the business cycle and the impaired labor markets during the Great Recession. As documented in the economics literature and something you can see very clearly in this chart, the headship rate has a very significant cyclical component and the business cycle conditions are the primary factors determining headship decisions in the short run. But as you can see here also, that blue line, the unemployment rate, has come down more sharply than the green line, which is the inverse of the headship rate. This suggests that as the economy and labor markets continue to improve, headship among millennials um, could rise and provide a boost to household formation, but it also suggests that there are other factors um, at play. While it's important um, to understand headship, it's also important to understand whether people are owning or renting. On average, construction um, of a multifamily unit results in 60% less of a contribution to GDP than a single family unit would. In the recovery so far, the decline in multifamily construction was relatively small and is fully recovered, while single family construction fell dramatically and remains well from recovered, as shown in this figure. Some argued that the explanation for this is a profound shift in preferences among millennials for owning versus renting. So that even if the headship rate and household formation were to recover, millennials would be a generation of renters rather than owners. I think, however, there's a lot of other plausible explanations, both for what we've seen in terms of headship and for the owning versus renting um, changes that we've seen. Um, for one, there doesn't appear to be a drastic shift in the home ownership rate over successive cohorts of young adults beyond the previously identified secular trend in delayed adulthood. The long run decline in ownership is present across income levels, but is largest for high earners, consistent with larger declines in headship among this group. Analysis undertaken by Trulia's chief economist, Jed Kolko, finds that the home ownership rate among young adults features a secular downward trend explained by changing demographics rather than any dramatic change in preferences. That said, as the sharp post-recession changes that I showed you tell, consistent with the longer standing cyclical patterns, there is good reason to believe that the increase in unemployment in the wake of the recession would have a commensurately large but temporary impact on both headship and home ownership. Other factors at play in the multifamily versus, um, versus own, owner occupied construction is um, what's gone on in mortgage credit in the wake of the recession. And that also has recovered less quickly than broader economic indicators like the unemployment rate. Indeed, research by Federal Reserve economist Neil Buta estimates that higher credit score thresholds used by lenders in the aftermath of the Great Recession can explain about 40% of the drop in first-time home buying in recent years relative to the early 2000s. 
In contrast, builders do not appear to be facing as many constraints to finance multifamily construction as with single family construction. Notably, issuance of private label commercial mortgage-backed securities has recovered to pre-bubble levels, and the Federal Reserve's Senior Loan Officer Opinion Survey has reported net easing of standards for commercial real estate loans for the last three years. Finally, the recovery in multifamily construction may be a byproduct of the uneven housing recovery. To date, construction of multifamily units has been concentrated in markets with relatively inelastic housing supply. On balance, these markets feature relatively high density and currently do not have a large supply of vacant homes. In contrast, the less dense markets with predominantly single family housing stock were hit hardest by the recession and still have an outsized overhang of vacant homes. Hence, the recovery in multifamily construction and low levels of simile single family construction that we see in the aggregate could reflect all of these factors, the differences in credit, the effects of the recession, and the different stages of the housing market recovery in these different markets. I wanted to briefly talk about um, one other hypothesis that people have put forward that links to the overall economic trends I described at the beginning of my talk remarks, which is the implication of student debt for home ownership. Many people have put forward this as a hypothesis, and um, theoretically, it's certainly very plausible. However, whether the burden of student debt is the ultimate cause of today's low home buying activity among young adults remains an open question empirically. On the one hand, higher student loan debt is a byproduct of the higher enrollment seen in recent years. If the higher returns to education justify the investment that millennials made, then one can view today's relatively low rates of home ownership among millennials as temporary. Schooling, rather than debt, is delaying household formation and home ownership till later in the life cycle. Eventually, these young adults will leave their parents' nests, rent homes, get married, buy homes, and have children. In this case, the outlook for home ownership is positive. However, many young people, including those with student loans, will face costs from entering the labor market during such a terrible recession, and those costs will be borne out for years to come. In addition, many students financing their education through debt may have been inadequately prepared to manage the financial complications of managing debt. For both of these groups, the burden of servicing existing um, student debt could make it difficult to save for a down payment and buy a home. Moreover, student debt isn't just about averages. It's about the greater, it's about variance too. And at the bottom, if you don't complete college, if you go to a lower quality school, your chances of defaulting are much higher with a commensurately higher impact on labor markets. I wanted to conclude by listing a few of the steps that the administration is taking to help foster a vibrant housing sector, which is important not in its, only in its own right, but also as a driver for economic growth, and in particular, the role of those policies for millennials. First, the president's overall economic agenda to create jobs, increase growth, and raise wages will help millennials in the housing market. Everything from infrastructure to business tax reform to workforce policies to the minimum wage plays a role in that. Second, policies that specifically focus on labor force attachment among young people can raise their labor force participation throughout life and offset the long-term declining trends in participation, an issue I discussed last week at the Hamilton Project at the Brookings Institution. Third, addressing, college, addressing student debt and college more broadly is essential. This includes not just measures focused at student debt specifically, but also making sure that we can increase college completion and address the quality of college as well, since so much of the issue is about the variance, as I said, not the averages. Finally, a range of housing policies can be particularly helpful for first-time home buyers, including many millennials. Mortgage credit is currently tighter than other forms of credit, 
And one reason that lenders point to is uncertainty over the conditions under which Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, and FHA will obligate lenders to repurchase mortgages should the borrower become delinquent. In May, the FHA embarked on a program to address these concerns, and acting independently, FHFA Administrator Director Mel Watt has also undertaken steps to provide clarity on so-called putback risk and thereby ease credit constraints in the mortgage market. The administration has also extended the Making Home Affordable program to continue to help struggling homeowners facing foreclosure or whose mortgages are underwater. And FHA announced a program in May to reduce lower insurance premiums for homeowners who receive housing counseling. While it may yet be revealed that millennials' preferences have changed permanently in light of the recession, I hope that some of the evidence I presented today suggests that more mundane um, explanations apply. Although we've seen a slow but steady evolution in areas like college attendance, marriage, and labor force participation for many decades, there's no strong reason to believe that millennials are dramatically different than the generation of Americans that preceded them. Rather, it is the unlucky economic times with which they were presented that explain much of their challenge. We have the ability to do a lot to address those challenges, and the onus is on us to do it. Thank you. Uh, there are two microphones here. If people have questions, please uh, please jump up. I'll, I'll start with one while, while people are gathering. Um, I'm wondering if you've seen any research around how um, millennials' rent versus buy experience in other areas of their life outside of housing might impact their perspective on housing. I mean, this generation is renting textbooks from Chegg. They're not buying them from the bookstore like we did. They're renting DVDs from Netflix, they're not buying them from stores, they're renting cars from Uber and Zipcar. They're, so in other parts of their lives, they're, they're, you know, they're, they're renting, not buying. And might that eventually impact their perspective on housing? I think that's a really interesting question, and it's not one we've looked at. In some sense, to the degree that you start with the more mundane standard economic explanations, you know, if it's hard to get credit, you're more likely to rent than to buy. If you don't have a job, you're well, more likely to do neither. Um, but if you do one, to rent. Um, so in some sense, we're going through the usual suspects mm -hmm. and trying to see if there's something large and left over. Mm -hmm. And to us, it doesn't feel like there's something large and left over. Um, that being said, you know, I think one would want to take that seriously. And I don't think anything you know, I've presented is close to conclusive mm -hmm. on these questions. So we'd, we'd want to stay tuned. Um, is there a question over here? Um, okay. Um, so um, I guess w what advice would you give? Let's say you had a, a younger sibling <laughs> or, or, or a niece or a nephew that were a millennial. We've learned that they're out of work, they're up to their eyeballs in student debt, they're going to get married later. Um, it, it, it sounds pretty grim. Uh, they're probably living at home. Um, what, uh, what advice would you give to this generation if, right. if you could speak to them? Right. I mean, I was trying to present a more nuanced picture of student <laughs> debt than, um, than your admittedly um, provocative Shorthand. statement. <laughs> Shorthand replied. You know, and if you look, on average, student debt is about $25,000. On average, you get about $15,000 per year of additional um, income from going to college. So on average, it's not only a great deal, but it's a great deal that will put you in a financially better position to buy a home. If you're making $15,000 a year more, um, you know, even with that extra 25000 in debt, you'll be better able to buy a home, not less. You know, often, because you go to college, you're probably going to get married a little bit later. You're potentially going to buy a home a little bit later. A lot of things will start later. Mm. Um, that's not necessarily a bad thing. That, that can be um, you know, a perfectly good thing. So I think the first piece of advice is you know, worry a lot about the bad case. You, know, you don't want to end up in a program where you draw, you know, a for-profit school that's a fly-by-night operation that you don't even get your degree from. You end up with a lot of debt. You don't get the commensurate earnings, and you are in a bunch of trouble. So worry about that. 
But don't be scared by those stories into missing the bigger point, which is that, you know, on average, um, for most, um, you know, it's a very good deal and it expands your prospects um, going forward. I, I mean, oh, oh, there's a question here. Okay, go ahead, yes, please. Hi, my name is Tony Mungrove from Century 21, Advantage Golden Philadelphia. And I have a question about policies that are geared to help the millennials. Um, invest while they're in school. This next generation, they're a lot smarter than we were, so they realize that being proactive early on is what counts, and they're asking me for duplexes where they can live and rent at the same time and make money while they're in school investing in real estate. Um, but because they're in debt and their credit scores might not be right, and are there any policies to help them <coughs> be proactive in doing that early? Um. I think, that's a, I think that's an interesting question. I, mean, I think a lot of that is a choice an individual has to make for themselves. Um, you know, if you're in college, you probably shouldn't be saving a lot. Um, chances are the return you're getting on your savings is less than uh, you know, the cost of your debt would be. So there's nothing wrong with smoothing your consumption over a life cycle um, at, you know, at, a, at a stage like that. But to some degree, the example you were talking about um, wasn't just renting, but in a sense working, um, in that renting that apartment, a lot of the return they're getting to that isn't just the capital they're putting into it, but is the time and effort. Um, and that might be, um, you know, in some cases, a, a higher return activity to them and a, and a good way to make some money um, on the side. So um, I should think more about the policy implications of that. But you know, I think a lot of things are you know, a choice that people can make or can't make. And there isn't you know, an awfully large role for government one way or the other. So we found that it's not a renter generation kind of at their core. It's the economic circumstances that they've been presented in terms of affordability, credit availability, and a bleak job market when they were coming out of school that has, has caused a decline in, in, in first-time home buyers and, and headship rate among millennials. And you don't think there's a, a fundamental shift in this generation of bias towards renting over buying that will persist kind of as they as their economic circumstances improve over the next 10 20 years. Yeah. Is I, fair to, is it a fair I think story? that is a I think it's fair to say that I place a lot of weight on that view. Okay. It's like everything it's still early, we're still sorting through it. You know, some things we won't see for years to come. So, I would not want to make a definitive statement along the, as definitive as what you just did even though that's that's more interesting. Um, but I think there's a lot of you know, more conventional, mundane explanations for what we've seen, both trend explanations and cycle explanations. And personally, I like to work through those. And if there's still a large mystery left, then you know, point to Netflix and Uber and whatever else as, as something fundamentally changing society. Um, so I think there's a lot of reasons to be somewhat skeptical of these large, discrete change stories. Mm -hmm. But you know, I certainly wouldn't wouldn't at all rule it out, and I'd, I'd be attentive to that possibility. One more? Oh, no? Okay, all right, I think we need to stay on schedule. So, Jason, thank you very, very much. Okay, thank you. Appreciate it.